What do you think of as the most important lessons from the 2008 financial crisis? Well, I think what it, what it taught us ultimately is that interventionism, monetary interventionism, is a, is a Faustian bargain. Um, it, it gives us really short-term gains, and with that comes longer-term uh, uh, pains. Um, I think we saw that previous to the last uh, crisis, and I think we're sort of going through the, the same, the same price, process now. I think what, what we, we ended up having is a market that is just very good at sort of sandbagging us. You know, it makes us feel uh, for a long time like we're smart, you know, like we all have an edge, which of course is impossible, we can't all have an edge. And then once we've up our bets, uh, it's kind of shown us, it shows us it's real, uh, it's real properties. Universally, your firm, and you by, by extension wouldn't have a business if there were no financial crises, but as a matter of principle, are corrections, crashes, market meltdowns, an inevitable necessary, maybe, feature of the modern financial system? Certainly of the modern financial system because of the way it's structured, particularly of the way it's structured in terms of, um, again, monetary interventionism. Interest rates are not free-floating. Um, so it doesn't have to be that way. You know, it's more of a philosophical disagreement between um, natural free markets. Are, are they sort of inherently fragile and need us to, 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 to protect ourselves from them? Um, and so it, it, it doesn't need to be that way, but unfortunately it is that way. Some people say crashes, maybe not necessarily as big as the one that we had in 2008, perhaps more along the lines of what we had in 2000 or what we've had since, some of the stuff that was brought on by sovereign debt bubbles and such in Europe are going to become more frequent. Do you think we'll see crashes more frequently? You know, I don't have a good feel for the frequency, the timing. It's something that I've always made very sure to stay away from, and the nature of my investing uh, affords me that. Um, I think we're going to continue to see deeper and deeper ones, and simply by virtue of the fact that um, the degree of interventionism um, is, is, is larger and larger. It gets, it gets incrementally higher um, every cycle. I mean, in some ways, we're still recovering sort of from that great bubble in 2000. And so we still, the, the, the economy needs more and more in order to keep us afloat from that. Tell me about the next crisis. What do you think it looks like? Um, um, you know, the, the, way I, the way I structure sort of risk mitigation, which is what I do, certainly, I, 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 it me means that I don't have the luxury of knowing what the next one's going to look like, thinking that I know what the next one is going to look like. I don't claim to know, have known what to, the 2008 um, looked like, even though we traded it uh, uh, the way we did. It's really, for me, investing the way I do, insur the insurance type of investing the way I do, is really about covering all your contingencies. You can't just isolate one contingency. Um, you need to be able to cover many of them. What I had in mind was more along the lines of this. People look back at 2008 and say, it was a once in seven decades event. We haven't seen anything like that since 1929 and the Great Depression. And it'll be another 70 years before we have another crisis like that. And I'm, I'm just trying to find out whether you think there's any validity to that kind of thinking. Is there, if you can't predict crashes, can anybody else? Yeah, there's validity to that. In, in many ways, I agree with it. But at the same time, you know, everyone knows you, you can't fight the Fed. Um, and you mustn't fight the Fed. What you, you, what you must try to do is sort of jujitsu the Fed. You, you need to sort of like use the Fed's force. Um, so again. the Fed is going to do what the Fed is going to do. In other words, and you as an investor have to res respond? Well, you need to be able to go with it in, in all directions, and that's really the point here. You know, there's a great a cliche that says offense wins games and defense wins championships. I mean, I hold that very close. It's what's a cliche that happens to be very, very true in the realm of investing, and that's because, of course, in, in compound returns, the rate of compounding is all we care about in investing, and it's the severe losses that crush the rate of compounding. It's not the small losses. So I really need to focus on the reason why I focus on the severe losses, the crashes. Um, um, so, so what does that mean? Um, you know, I call, the, the, I call this a volatility tax, where large losses crush your rate of compounding. Um, so you know, we need to think about that. You know, the, von Kolosevitz's first principle is you know, secure your base. And 
this is what we all try to do in portfolio management is to secure our base. But it's not, it's not what we do get through modern portfolio theory. Now, when you describe yourself as a portfolio manager, many people might be confused. They think of as a portfolio manager as somebody who is trying to make money by taking positions that are going to increase in value or generate return over time. You're doing something different. Yes, certainly. Um, what I do, listen, to, to think about it simply, Universa is, is a safe haven, but it's a particularly explosive insurance-like safe haven. And it's there specifically so, you know, the more explosive it is, the more risk, systematic risk, um, my clients uh, are, are able to take. Many investors who hedged or who diversified gave up much of the upside in equities since the financial crisis, and we need only look at hedge fund returns, for example, to see that. Yeah. Now, hedge funds don't necessarily need to beat the S&P 500, but they do have to deliver value to their customers, and many of their customers or clients don't think they've been doing that. What did these investors who hedged or who diversified do wrong? Well, again, modern portfolio theory sold us a bill of goods. And that bill of goods is that if you, if you lower your volatility through diversification, it's this dogma of diversification, you lower your volatility, yes, you're also going to lower your arithmetic return. But if you get that ratio going up, all is well. And then you can take some leverage, which is kind of crazy in and of itself, that risk, good risk mitigation requires leverage. Um, and all is well, and you'll raise your long-run return. But it just doesn't, it hadn't, hasn't worked out that way. As we diversify, you know, diversification is really what we're doing when we diversify. Um, diver diversification, of course, in this environment, too, where all correlations spike to one when you least can afford them to, um, it's a fundamental problem. Uh, and it's, it's so contrary to the way I think about it. It's, it's a completely new way of, the way I think about it, um, constructing portfolios. And it, again, it's about focusing on the downside, mitigating the, the volatility tax. So if people want to understand a bit better what you do, and more and more, you know, with some $10 billion under management now, people are beginning to see the value in what you do, Help us, help us appreciate the nature of a tail risk hedge. What's, what kinds of things are in the universal portfolio? Well, without getting into specifics, um, you know, as I said, it's, it's an explosive insurance-like payoff, but the sp specifically explosive insurance-like convex payoff to what you have in your portfolio. So that's the important thing. We can't get too fancy, in my view, um, about, once again, thinking about exactly what that next crash is going to look like. We, you know, we need to get all the contingencies right. So that, what that means is, um, whatever your exposures are, um, you need to have very, in terms of tail hedging, you need to have very specific convex downside crash convexity um, to those exposures. But that, you, you find that where? In out-of-the-money options? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a range of places where we can find this in the derivatives markets. Um, that certainly is... It's principally derivatives we're talking about. I mean, in order to get the, the, types of, the type of asymmetry that I'm talking about, it really requires um, the use of, of derivatives, yes. So that's a, good, that's a good simple way to think about it, yes. Are, we learned in 2008 that derivative contracts themselves can blow up. Mm -hmm. Are the derivatives that your if you will, trafficking in now, safer instruments than they were in 2008? Um, I'm not sure. Again, this is a contingency I don't want to have to think about. I don't feel like I have an edge in that. I don't feel like anybody has an edge, edge in that. You know, we all suffer from this hindsight bias where we think we had that last, that last crash, for instance, um, figured out. We think we understood the cause and effect. You know, I don't have the luxury of cause and effect. I don't have the luxury of thinking everything through exactly the way it's going to pan out because I, I will absolutely be wrong. So my simple... Um, solution to that is, you know, I don't take single entity counterparty risk. Um, you know, I face the exchanges. Now, it's it, it, the saying goes, it's kind of like um, buying buying Titanic insurance from someone who's on the Titanic. It's just not a great idea. The cost of protection, at least as measured by the VIX, and I know that that's an imperfect measure, has mostly been low, mostly, over the past ten years. What if insurance gets more expensive? Um, what if it does? It's, it's, it's likely to be associated with an event that tends to be how it works. I mean, we saw it happen very briefly uh, last February. 
Um, uh, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, in this, this age, how quickly, when we see these flare-ups, how quickly it all comes back, back um, to, to cheapness again. So, uh, you know, I, I expect we'll continue to see that. And the reason is, you know, selling insurance is just sort of the most obvious and most straightforward way to sort of earn this extra yield. We're in this yield-starved, yield-chasing environment. Again, it goes back to central banks. But how is it that those guys who were, if you will, selling insurance got destroyed <laughs> in February, and, and you didn't? Because I'm on the other side of that trade. I mean, I, I remember I'm not selling insurance. I'm fundamentally on the other side of that, of that trade. I'm, I'm purchasing insurance from the market, um, insurance light payoffs um, um, in the market. So there's a really pretty steady drumbeat of supply on the other side because it feels so good. It feels good structurally as a professional trader. It feels good, sort of cognitively, to um, to, to to make these these little this little premium most of the time.